some of the specifics about concussion can be really challenging to manage. So I think a practitioner can often be quite overwhelmed. Then they might be difficult for the patient to know, well, who is the next person to see and how do I get access to them? That's Dr. Shannon Bauman, a leading concussion expert and founder of Concussion North, a groundbreaking clinic with a multidisciplinary approach to treating concussions. We're thrilled to have her back as our guest on this episode of Concussion Central, the podcast that changes the way you get your information about concussions. Hi, and welcome to Concussion Central. I'm your host, David McGuffin. Our aim on this podcast is to help you, the listener, navigate the often very confusing world of concussions, diagnosis, and treatment. We understand that for those living with a concussion, the best way to receive information isn't by reading, it isn't online, it isn't on a screen, it's by listening. We hear you. So on this podcast, we'll be bringing you regular audio interviews with some of the world's leading experts on the many aspects of concussions. And I'm really thrilled to welcome Shannon Bauman back to the podcast. If you haven't heard her first interview with us, in part about how her own concussion dramatically changed the way she approaches treatment, definitely check that out. It's fascinating. We brought Shannon back on to talk about the concussion patient experience and how the concussion passport she developed can help patients maneuver through a medical system that often lacks important diagnosis and treatment knowledge. So Shannon, welcome back to Concussion Central. Thanks again for having me. This is a lot of fun for me, so I really appreciate being on. Well, we're so glad to have you back. Our last episode, we spoke with someone you've worked with as well, Dr. Shalina Babul, who developed the concussion awareness training tool in an effort to improve concussion knowledge amongst the general public and even more critically amongst the medical profession, because there's still a lot of gaps in understanding for key medical gatekeepers in concussion treatment, like emergency room doctors and your family doctor, among others. So in your experience, where are those concussion knowledge gaps for the patient? I think in healthcare now, exactly kind of as you had said, David, is the patient becomes their own advocate. They really become the voice of directing some of their care, which helps when there are some of these gaps. Um, The challenge is for the patient is sometimes they understand what they're feeling. They know what their symptoms are. They may know how it's affecting their day to day. But what they need help with then is once they've communicated that is really knowing what the next steps are and what the plan of care is going to be. And sometimes there's gaps just between their own understanding of where these symptoms are coming from, meaning what is causing it and what kind of care is available. And there's also some gaps in maybe the practitioner they're seeing as far as understanding um, concussion and the symptoms they're getting. Maybe, you know, as family physicians, there's so many things they have to be a specialist in. And they have one of the hardest jobs, I think, of anybody in our healthcare system. But some of the specifics about concussion can be really challenging to manage. So I think a practitioner can often be quite overwhelmed when someone comes in with multiple symptoms of maybe different systems and how to pull that together. I think is one thing that is just a experience in managing concussions, a knowledge gap per se, but I think it's also knowing for those family physicians where to refer and having access to people they can refer to in a timely way that may have that knowledge and experience uh, to help the family physician support their patient and then provide the next more specialty level of care, because I think concussions can be difficult to manage Mm -hmm. and they might be difficult for the patient to know, well, who is the next person to see and how do I get access to them? So I think the second big gap is finding that pathway of who the right people are to see and how to access them in our current healthcare system. I mean, there's probably to talk about gaps for the medical profession, but obviously for patients, there's gaps too. And I'm just How does someone know when their concussion isn't getting better? What are the things they need to be looking out for? That's a good question. I think, you know, some of our concussion guidelines define persistent symptoms or prolonged symptoms as symptoms that are lasting longer than two to four weeks in an adult patient. 
longer than four weeks in a pediatric patient, so 18 and under. So when we look at um, Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation uh, created a great resource um, of concussion with persistent symptoms in adult, 18 and over. Um, Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation also created a really great pediatric guidelines. Where these guidelines, I think, are very important is they were developed to be user-friendly where patients and healthcare practitioners can both access these. And the way it's laid out, Mm -hmm. they could look, for example, by heading. They could look for headaches. And if headaches are persisting, it can give some ideas for treatment for both the patient and the care uh, the care team or the physician. Um, it could look at persistent symptoms such as dizziness and how to approach that or visual issues, uh, sleep issues, mood, uh, intolerance to day-to-day activity and exercise, um, sleep, just a lot of important aspects of concussion. And if these symptoms continue to persist beyond kind of that two to four week mark, the sooner that someone can connect with more specialty care and multidisciplinary care, it's been shown to have a better outcome and shorter recoveries for that patient. So, I mean, you mentioned people sort of looking around for information and you mentioned persistent concussion syndrome, which some people might find, and there's also an acute concussion. Can you explain the difference of what those two things would be? It has been a challenge even in definition amongst the expert level at the world consensus. And I think even when we're when I get to be a part of some of the committees I'm at, when you get different experts in the room, mm-hmm. everyone has a slightly different take. So I could see why <laughs> these uh, definitions are uh, confusing because it is, it's confusing even amongst people who <laughs> use these terms. But in, I guess this is just my uh, my take on how I would explain it. But an acute concussion really starts the minute that you have an event or an incident where either there's a direct hit to the head or an indirect hit to the head, meaning you could slip and fall and land on your tailbone or you could hit your shoulder really hard. If there's enough force that's extended to the head to cause even a single one symptom of concussion, that could be defined as a concussion. Mm -hmm. So then once that concussion is diagnosed, then you have a more formal diagnosis. But I would say acute concussion begins really the minute that impact occurs. And that concussion continues through kind of a phase that I would say is then the subacute concussion. So you have the acute concussion, and then you have kind of a subacute concussion where in that part of the recovery, I call that physiologic recovery. That's when we can examine certain aspects within that patient that matches with their symptoms, such as some subtleties on a vision exam, some symptoms with the neck exam that trigger symptoms. Um, You can do some vestibular exam screening, and that's enough to bring on dizziness or headache. Um, You could put this person in through some exercise protocols, and they start to have symptoms as their heart rate hits a certain level. This is our physiologic signs that concussion is still present. Mm -hmm. And in this phase, really, we want to make sure that this gets to a full resolution. And a full resolution means the symptoms recover as well as these signs, these physiologic signs of concussion make a full recovery. And that's when we determine that a full recovery has occurred and that medical clearance is really determined at that point. So that length of time from the acute concussion to full recovery is going to be individual. That timeline is going to be different amongst each individual and different with each concussion. So if we want to look at kind of a definition, I would say acute is that first phase, but that extends into a subacute, which could be after the two to four weeks. Then, or it could be within that if that person makes a shorter recovery, Clearance is kind of determined when medically we can say the person's symptoms have resolved, their physiology has fully recovered back to within normal pre-concussion levels or an expected normal value, and that person has been able to get back to a full day-to-day routine without symptoms, 
gotten back to a full school or a full work day, and then been able to get back to a full exercise, recreation, or sport level, that's when we would determine a medical clearance. That's a lot to cram in that question. No, there's, no, no, it's great. And there's a lot in there I want to pull out. But I mean, you, you mentioned too that the concussions are so individual and they people are affected in different ways almost every single time. So just looking at going beyond the acute, I mean, at what point should someone, and I know this is not an easy answer to this, but at what point should someone go back to their family doctor if they've been sure. diagnosed? At what point would you recommend? I think, you know, what we put into... Um, through Parachute um, and ONF, we looked at kind of time points in the medical system. So Ontario Neurotrauma Foundation published provincial standards for concussion care. And in that flow diagram, um, what we looked at was different points of access. So that first access point might be the emergency room, it could be an urgent care, it could be a sports medicine doctor, it could be a family doctor. That would be the first person that does an examination of that patient. It's usually recommended, depending on what setting, if they went to see an emergency room or urgent care, they should probably follow up within their, with their family doctor as soon as they can get an appointment, because that's going to be hopefully, ideally, within one week's time. At that point, the family doctor is going to be looking at confirming the diagnosis that was made, or they might be doing an initial diagnosis, and they're going to already be probably have looked at sleep, headaches, day-to-day functions, school, they are able to get that person started with some early strategies for management. At the point where they see them back, and I would say probably a two-week mark is ideal if possible, Mm -hmm. um, because as we said, adults kind of zero to two weeks are still considered within a normal kind of recovery phase. After two weeks, we're starting to look for adults at persistent symptoms. At that point, at that two-week appointment, that's really when if things aren't going, if things are starting to resolve and going the right direction, and the family doctor feels it's just supportive management, helping them further with return to work, and then helping um, the symptoms are resolving and helping them determine a full clearance, the family doctor can continue to manage that. If at that two-week point, um, the family doctor feels, you know what, there's some things that I really feel could be a risk factor for a prolonged recovery, and we outlined those in the uh, provincial standards document, things like persistent migraines that aren't being managed and are not getting better, um, visual issues that are affecting school or work and are not getting better or are becoming um, more troublesome Um, vestibular issues, again, that are becoming a challenge for day-to-day and function and not seeming to recover, Uh, mood issues, sleep issues, things that they feel like, you know what, this isn't going to be something that's just on its way that it's resolving, but something that I would like a physician with an interdisciplinary team to start getting involved at that two-week mark, that's when they would make that referral to a specialist, which would be a physician who has experience in concussion care, who can then direct kind of multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary care. That physician would be someone like myself, and the role I would play would be saying, let me re-examine this patient for some of these specifics that are more high risk, and then let me determine how to manage these and give some strategies, but I might also then link them up with occupational therapy, athletic therapy, vestibular, uh, physiotherapy, chiropractic, uh, osteopath, depending on what their symptom profile says, let's get someone else involved on the rehab side to help get this concussion better faster. So at that point, at the two-week mark for adults, and I would say with your pediatric patient, the way that our guidelines kind of lay out is really kind of more between that two and four-week Um, point. So the point where their family physician may refer might be closer to four weeks because that's still within the realm of kind of an expected normal recovery. Unless, again, they identify red flags, meaning things that might put that person at risk for a persistent prolonged recovery, they Mm -hmm. could refer at any time 
to a physician with experience in concussion care. So if that person that plays high-risk sports, maybe they are a AAA hockey player and they need more guidance on the return to play side, maybe they need someone to help them with that, with a combination of some vestibular aspects they're having. That family physician may say, you know what, this is harder to do in the office to direct. I need someone that can do some hands-on in-clinic work with this person for their return to play that's someone that they may identify to refer or someone who's maybe had challenging concussions in the past. And this concussion seems to be already struggling with migraine and sleep and issues that seem that, okay, given this person's history, maybe I'm concerned that this person might have a prolonged recovery, this concussion, I'm going to refer early because I feel like it needs more management and interdisciplinary approach. I mean, we talk a lot in this podcast about the invisible symptoms of concussion and how that makes it challenging because people look like they're fine, but you know they'll have all these other symptoms like dizziness and nausea or inability to focus. So if a patient's dealing with a family doctor or, or a medical professional who maybe they don't feel like is getting their problems, um, I mean, what? how do you recommend people change that dynamic? I mean, how do you recommend you get to that point where you go to the specialist or get the referral to the specialist? I think this is the point where it, it really is kind of establishing that rapport with a family physician first, mm -hmm. if, if possible, really kind of explaining, you know, maybe as the patient saying, you know what, I understand we've already been working towards some of the aspects of my concussion. I'm a bit concerned about my persistent headaches We've tried these approaches, and I'm wondering if there is someone else that we can add to our care team. I think kind of maybe the language and how you approach it, um, then that physician hopefully will say, you know what, what I'm hearing from this patient is they're still struggling with the headaches. I've tried as much as I'm able to do at this point, and they would really like another opinion I think then it's kind of saying, okay, who could I find that I might recommend to them? And it could be asking the patient, uh, do you have some someone in mind that you'd like to see? And maybe that patient has heard from a friend who had a good experience with a certain specialist, or maybe that patient is asking and asking the physician to say, well, I'm open to some ideas, or maybe I could see a physiotherapist. Do you have some recommendations? So this is kind of where the challenge is of finding the right person at the right time to treat the right symptom. And it may come from the patient advocating for a certain direction or the physician's experience in working with a certain person where they would say, I know if I sent it to this person, they could help us with the next steps. So I think it's kind of working together, the patient and the physician, uh, to see if they can work towards the next steps together. I think for patients, sometimes it is challenging. And I've, I mean, I'm, I've heard from patients that they don't feel listened to and supported at times. And then they may seek going to see someone on their own. They might find a physiotherapist that works with concussion and they start developing their own network of people <laughs> to see. I think in an ideal world, you know, the communication um, gets back to the family physician so everybody uh, can work together with that patient. But I think at the end of the day, ultimately, the patients are going to seek care really because they're looking for help and they're looking to get better. And until they're resolved, they're going to try many different things that they can. Um, so I think the goal is always really that full recovery and feeling better no matter you know, which path they take. But if we could make that path easier for mm -hmm. patients, I think it would be more efficient in our system and ultimately maybe more cost effective. I think some of our stats have said before that uh, an average patient probably connects with six to 10 different providers before they land on um, the provider that's going to help them reach that resolution in their concussion. And in a system where the care that's OHIP-based is going to be the physician, 
much of that care is going to be out of pocket mm -hmm. or if someone's fortunate to have benefits, but it can get quite costly to seek multiple multidisciplinary people and try to figure out who that person is. And if you're seeing six to 10 people before you land on the right person, you've probably spent a lot financially invested into this. And then once you land on care, it may take several sessions to get this person mm -hmm. better as well. So I think in our system, in looking at how to streamline more efficient and effective concussion care, it would be ideal if we had more physician-led interdisciplinary clinics throughout the province and the country and had established centers where there was a go-to, where family doctors knew where to refer to and patients knew where to get care. And if this was set up in different locations and supported, mm -hmm. I think it would really help streamline care and help with a lot of the gaps and pitfalls we currently mm -hmm. have in our system. I also wonder, you know, obviously when you're, you have a concussion, a lot can feel overwhelming and just having the idea of having to go through six to 10, you know, caregivers, doctors to, to find your solution can be a lot. And I'm wondering how important you see having a medical advocate, a family member or someone who is attending your, your appointments with you. I mean, what role is, does that person play? And is that an important role to have? I think you said it exactly, David. I think it's really overwhelming being the patient with a concussion. First, there's probably some sensory issues. There's probably difficulty uh, with vision. It could be a really bright medical exam office or a window that's open behind that there's glare. It could be a lot of noise and stimuli where that person might get to the appointment and within 10, 15 minutes or before they've even entered the room, they're already at their tap out max. And mm -hmm. so we know that um, it's also difficult to retain the information cognitively after a concussion. And so whenever I would see a patient, I'd, I would say, make sure you bring someone with you because we're going to cover a lot of information and I don't expect you to remember <laughs> everything we say and some of the things we're doing might bring out some symptoms, which makes it even more difficult to remember all the things we talked about at the appointment. So if you can bring someone to each of your appointments and if that person can join you for different rehabilitation appointments, I think it's always good to have not only an extra set of ears, but also ahead of time, tell that person your questions. So if it gets to the end and you had questions that you kind of at that point were about ready to say, I'm done, mm -hmm. I got to go, my symptoms are up, you could at least have that person say, before we go, these are the questions that we really wanted to make sure got answered today. So I think it's hugely important, but also for that support. Um, I think being a person who's had a concussion and having a supportive person to be there for you or drive you home from that appointment when you're already feeling pretty lousy. Um, just making sure they help care for your basic needs at that point, just to help you and to be that emotional support. And also that sounding board, because they may have heard things slightly different during the appointment that than you had heard, um, just because there's emotion that plays a part as well. Um, so I would say yes. I mean, absolutely. I would always prefer to have somebody with each patient, mm -hmm. even if they're an adult and um, bring a friend, bring a partner, bring mm -hmm. a husband, bring yeah. anyone that can be that advocate for you and be there for that appointment. Yeah. And take notes. I, I found that out. It was so helpful because you forget yeah. things, you know, even a day later, you know, if those notes are there for the next appointment, it, it saves you going over the same ground again. It saves you so many things. Yeah. I usually created a folder for each person and I gave them a folder to take home and I would put a copy of each of the things we went through in the appointment. Here's a article that kind of summarizes what we said today, or here's an update on some of the things, or let's put your prescription prescription copy in this folder. And then I asked the patient to bring the folder back each time and just say, if you have some things that come up between the time I see you, put some notes down and put it in your folder and bring it to the appointment. So I kind of got in the habit of <laughs> purchasing some concussion North folders that I would give each person from their first appointment and then say, each time you see someone for your rehab, have them add to the folder 
that way you have all of your concussion things in one spot and uh, they can take some notes along between appointments and bring it with them each time. In part to solve all of these problems we're talking about, you've developed the Concussion Passport, which people can find on your Concussion North website. Um, and I recommend people do that. But can you explain, I mean, how you developed that and, and what it does? Yeah, I think, as you mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, is trying to simplify and create a tool that helps patients. Um, that was kind of the basis for the Concussion Passport. The idea of the passport was truly like your passport. It's meant to travel with you. So this concept of the patients going on a concussion journey and different people are going to be part of their care team on this journey. So the passport was meant to be a tool to do several things, but meant to connect all of the people on its journey for the patient. The first premise of the passport was that it was controlled by the patient. So the patient has the passport, they share it with who they would like it to be shared with. So for example, their family physician's probably part of their care team. They may have a physiotherapist working with them. They might be a student or they might be someone that works and they'll share it with either their teacher or a coach or an employer, depending on who they want to share it with. Um, and then they would bring that back for appointments. They could be, if they're referred to vision, they could share it with the person they go to see for vision. So the idea is that it's controlled by the patient. We create it as a, um, it's about a 24 page heavy duty pamphlet type booklet, but it's meant to travel with the patient and people are meant to be able to add some updated dates when a patient achieves certain outcomes that are laid out in the passport. So the idea is that it's a communication tool to number one, communicate good concussion care. I'll talk about that in a second. And secondly, communicate with the patient and their team members to bring their team as if they're one yeah. team under one roof. So in, you know, the current, network. They might have people in all different locations. So it's meant to bring together a cohesive team and a cohesive plan with um, the goal of this, of really getting that patient to that full resolution and full clearance at the end of their journey. So the aspect of uh, communicating good care was basically saying each journey the patient's going to go on is going to be outlined by steps. So it was made very visually um, simple, really with just kind of some little points as if they're going along on a map um, from the first step to the last step of that system recovering. So the first part of the journey um, could be the return to learn, return to work. So we called it the return to earn, return to learn. And it was phases someone would go through just simply outlining the phases from uh, starting back to work and increasing hours with modifications that they might be doing, then increasing further hours, requiring less modifications till ultimately they're able to do full work or a full school day. And that could be helped along by any member of a care team. It could be an occupational therapist. It could be an athletic therapist. It could be a physician helping them, but that's one journey. A second journey could be their physical activity journey, and it might start with some low cardiac, kind of like a 15-minute walk, and then it talks about vestibular control, meaning we're not adding in the vestibular system at that point. Then as we go further along the physical journey, it could guide someone back up to their full exercise level or full return to sport, whatever is applicable, but towards the end, there's different stages that we start adding in some of the vestibular aspects like head turns, looking up and down. Maybe they're doing sports specific movements, um, exercise movement based where you're doing some different balance incorporated. So that journey takes them on an exercise journey return. Then we have a vestibular journey. So if the person has a physiotherapists that may not specialize in vestibular, but maybe they have some understanding, they may be able to utilize someone in their community who could then utilize the passport and the steps and say, oh, okay, at this point, I'm adding in some eye movements. 
with head control. At this point, I'm adding in some head movements with left and right head turn or up and down head turn. So it really does provide a little bit of guidance towards what that might look like. And if a physiotherapist is maybe being involved or a family doctor and they say, gosh, I'm not really sure I fully understand this, they may then say, I need to refer to someone who has this certification and has this specialty. Now I'm going to look for a healthcare professional who has a vestibular certification um, and that expertise because I need some help with that part of the journey for this patient. And then um, there's a vision journey where the person, if they're having some visual issues, it walks through what that might look like. And again, this might signal to the provider, I need to refer to a neuro-ophthalmologist or mm-hmm. neuro-optometrist. This is getting a bit more complex. But the idea of this is an integrated journey. Not each of these journeys is an individual silo, but a patient may be at, let's say, step two of one of them and step three on another journey and step two at another journey. So they can look at, there's one page that shows all the journeys integrated. And I think that that's an important concept because we often think of, unless this person is doing these things for school, we can't start any exercise. So there was kind of some early ideas that until they've fully gone back to school or work, we're not starting any of the exercise aspect. But what this shows you in the passport is that you're working on all these journeys simultaneously. You're going to have someone working with the school or work piece. You're going to have someone working with vestibular, someone working with vision, someone working with um, the aspects of the physical and they're all integrated. So each person feels their care is all brought Mm -hmm. together under one care plan. So the purpose of the passport is really to empower the patient and also use it as a communication tool to communicate the standards of care, communicate the multidisciplinary approach and communicate between the care providers and the patient and the patient and their family, whoever's part of their big care team. So everybody's on the same page with the goal of the last step, really getting to the finish line of each journey. And then there's a final medical clearance page where the physician who's providing medical clearance can go through a checklist to make sure every journey has been successfully achieved and that person has achieved a full resolution of their concussion. It lays it all out for you. And what it's impressive about it too is I think recovery is is much about having a sense of hope. And I think if you have all this in front of you, it provides that hope that's so key to to getting better. And that was kind of one part that we wanted to do. It was kind of a way to show people where they were in their recovery because it was one thing I heard a lot of from patients was am I almost cleared? Mm. Am I nearing clearance? Am I, I feel like I'm back to the beginning again. And what you could do and what I often did was pull it back out and say, well, this is kind of where your update is this week on this system. Let's look at where you're at. And sometimes I would look at it and also say to them, you know what, all of your journeys are moving towards really clearance. We're kind of here. And it would empower the patient to say, oh, okay, I felt like I'm going to be in this forever. And you can say, look, like you're almost there. You can use it as a bit of an encouragement too, to say, hey, you only have one step left. You're almost there. Let's just keep at this a little bit more. You're almost there. Because people, if you ask them, they'll often say, well, yeah, I think I'm 50% better. or I think I'm 75% better. And that 75%, it just changes any time. It's hard to really gauge what that is. But if you have very objective information, you can say, look, you just have one step left here, two steps left here. Let's really focus our attention on, you know, really getting these systems to get to resolution. But it, I agree. It's kind of a way to empower them, to keep them motivated. If you kind of see how much you have left, it's easier to yeah. get there. But it's also a nice way to say, okay, if these systems aren't improving, what are we missing? And sometimes you can say, well, these aspects can't make the next step because we're still on some visual aspects that aren't allowing us to progress the vestibular or aren't allowing us to help you back to work. 
So if we say, wow, there's something that's really here that we haven't addressed yet, it's also kind of a way to empower the patient to say, let's get that referral to the neuro optometrist at this point. I think that's the key step to get these other journeys to come together. And that might also be if the patient is looking at that saying to their family physician, hey, I think I need to see someone for this part because things aren't coming along. So I I think it is also a point of reflecting on the care that's being done and where we need to go to get to the next step. Fantastic. I I also know you did a study on the effectiveness of the passport, which you published in the Journal of Concussion. And what did you find? I think what we wanted to do was really look at the tool and say, we think it helps communication. We think it communicates types of care that are needed. We think that it does um, empower the patient. But what we wanted to know from the patient was, was this effective in each of those objectives. So what we did was um, a survey that went along. We had patients randomized to either receiving the passport or the group that didn't get the passport, but they got the same communication, the same care in both groups. So the only difference was really the addition of the passport in one group. Then at the end, we administered the survey to see what patients' understanding was of the care, both with and without the passport to say, did the passport intervention change care? And the results were were very strong. We really had a significant response in almost every question that we had asked at the passport to a high degree did show that it improved understanding of a patient's experience and understanding of concussion within an interdisciplinary team. So it was... Uh, something that we did publish and each of the members of our interdisciplinary team had great contributions to that, uh, to the passport as well as to the paper. Yeah. So overall it did show that this was a very successful tool and my hopes moving forward is that there's a way to make this tool even more available to people and that uh, we can get this in the hands of people who need it. Excellent. Well, do you have any last thoughts on best practices for patients advocating as they go through the system? I think concussion is, as I've always kind of said, it's the concussion can be a puzzle when it gets uh, more persistent and it's always looking for that missing puzzle piece. And I think what patients really need to know is that they need to keep seeking (laughs) that care to really get their life back and get feeling better. And even if you've tried different approaches, you know, the next one might just be around the corner and really as discouraging and frustrating sometimes it can be. There are really great people out there and you might, you know, be able to have someone that you just didn't expect be involved in your care. And that person might be the one that helps you with that last puzzle piece. So I think, you know, the biggest challenge having, I mean, I had a concussion that took two years to fully resolve. And there were many times that I thought, or was told, this is your new normal, just get Mm -hmm. used to this and try to figure out how to live your life within what you still have for symptoms. And I guess my challenge is, is you know, really continuing to seek that care because I truly believe people can make that full recovery and it's just, it can be challenging to find it, but you can find the care that'll help you get to the next point, but it also takes, takes some work to get there too. It's not an easy road and putting the time into some of these exercises that make you feel awful (laughs) and you think, oh, I don't want to do these. It just makes me feel worse, but there are things that keep building on your systems and get you stronger and really help you overcome the symptoms that you're going through and it will get better. So keep seeking care, keep believing that great care is out there and stay positive and keep being your best advocate um, because that's the way this is going to keep improving and the system's going to change if we keep advocating for better. Um, So that would be my my message. Well, that's a positive note to end it on. 
thank you so much, Shannon, for coming back on the podcast. I always learn so much. Thank you very much, David. This was a lot of fun. And thank you for listening. That's it for this episode of Concussion Central. If you enjoy this podcast, please do us a big favor and give us a rating and write a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. It helps us to reach a bigger audience with these interviews and this information. And remember to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. For more information on the work of Concussion Central, you can visit us at concussioncentral.ca. And until next time, I'm David McGuffin.